moving and we're, yeah, but we've had 500,000 or well, 200, 520,000, something like that, deaths from COVID right. thus far, you know, so. Huge numbers. Huge numbers. I don't know in, um, in India how many, but uh, I think must be 100,000 or so, probably. I mean, yeah. when you're in England, I'm going to interrupt now and we can- okay. Please, please do. And Harish will be recording from this point on, so we okay. just recording, all right? Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us at uh, this edition of this online edition of the Poetry with Prakriti Festival. Uh, my job here is to briefly introduce to you the festival and then hand over to our poet and moderator for today. Uh, the Prakriti Foundation is an arts and culture NGO based in Chennai, uh, in the Nadu, and uh, it was founded in 1998. It has been a space for scholars, for researchers, artists, critics uh, of all kinds to uh, present their work and to engage with audiences uh, on serious terms, on their own terms with the work. Uh, the they has a number of festivals uh, running throughout the year and in different parts of India. Poetry with Prakriti is one of them. Traditionally, Prakriti, Poetry with Prakriti has been a festival in Chennai with a number of uh, poets from all over India and visiting poets from other parts of the world as well, reading to audiences in a variety of venues ranging from the usual, which is things like, say, bookstores and uh, you know art galleries and stuff like that, to completely unconventional venues like uh, infotech parks and shopping malls, restaurants, uh, out in public. It's been a wonderful festival, which over the years has invited poets of in incredible variety, poets who are well-established, well-known, as well as young voices or new voices that are coming in as well. Um, this year, or rather from uh, 2020, unfortunately, the festival's organizing team decided, took an early call and decided that there would not be a festival in December and instead started planning an online festival which started in October. So every, uh, the first three Saturdays of every month, each Saturday is a different poet, reading their work for around 15 to 20 minutes and then engaging in conversation with a moderator and answering questions from the audience as well. Uh, by this time, by December next year, we'll be able to be in a world where Prakriti can go back to having a festival that is in the flesh and poets can hang out and chat together. But the wonderful bonus, of course, has been that this particular festival can now be reached by, uh, can reach out and be seen and heard by people all over the world. We'll be, we are, of course, recording as well and it will stay in the archives. Uh, I'm going to ask you folks to, if you have questions, to only put them into the uh, Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom of your screens. Uh, our moderator will recognize those questions. We ask you to please keep the questions brief to uh, have them in some connection with the poetry that the poet is presenting, uh, the, the particular poems that they're presenting. And you're of course will, will, welcome to also ask larger questions about craft and about uh, the poetic practice we will uh, try and answer all the questions that come up. We ask for your, uh, you know, your forgiveness in advance if we are unable to get to all of them. I'm now going to hand this over to Abhimanyu, who is going to be our moderator for today. Abhimanyu is a journalist and a poet and a translator, and he has a relationship with Imran, which uh, will come out in the conversation that they have after the burn. So I'm going to hand it over to him right now uh, to take us through the rest of the evening. Abhimanyu, all yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Griffin, for your uh, introduction. And it is a uh, sheer pleasure and delight, as well as an honor for me to uh, host this session of uh, Indran reading his poems. And I'm sure everybody uh, has had an opportunity to go through uh, his bio that was, uh, I think, uh, circulated. And uh, 
but at the same time i would like to read a short text first uh, which is uh, my impression and understanding of uh, imran uh, as a person and uh, as a poet as well and uh, so i would just like to uh, carry on with that um, i first chanced upon imran amrit amir sanaygam's prose instead of his poetry it was a foreword he had written for a good friend and fellow poet's first poetry collection it was a generous foreword for a new poet starting out the other thing that struck me was his invocation of allen ginsberg while commenting on my friend's poetry and it is to allen ginsberg as mr kipin said that actually we kind of share our connection through the uh, great beat poet and um, so uh, when i checked with my friend i learned that in then uh, of course new ginsberg personally and uh, because his father was friends with him and uh, there was also a very uh, interesting anecdote in which uh, Uh, Bob Dylan once called at their home for uh, uh, Ginsberg, who was uh, staying with the Amrit Nagams, and uh, which Indran had picked up. And uh, uh, this is how I, I mean, this anecdote kind of uh, appealed to me a great deal because you don't have Bob Dylan calling your, uh, you know, I mean, father or at your home every other day. And um, but after that, I mean, over the years, as I said, I started with the prose, but then I started to read his uh, poetry, and then I learned, um, of course, which is amazing that he writes in five languages. i also started to notice that uh, there is uh, a certain generosity of spirit in his poetry which shines if i could say like a watchtower over the choppy waters of the sea of life it imbues all he writes with a certain light which illuminates his lines allowing them a texture which is warm and thick like wool but breathed like the soft muslin of old dhaka in its soft whisper we hear a breathing a breathing we hear which could be an echo a solitary muffled cry a long scream Uh, or even a primal howl we hear incantations to the muse to the spirit within that moves us and sends us uh, places to roam like ulysses always in search of a homeland which uh, is uh, i think important in inder's uh, hour and his uh, journey as a poet and a per- as a person because uh, he was born in sri lanka and then he has lived all over the globe and now he lives in the us uh, where he works in the foreign service and he has had a long career there and uh, but in indran's work these boundaries dissolve and uh, i feel souls are exchanged um, and they live in a tower of babel which is his brilliant mind in many tongues his poems leap at us like fire at our ignorance and prejudices taking them down turning them into embers that glow as a recollection a remembrance as well as a premonition of what the world has been and what it can be a place of hope and succor for all full of love and kindness and wisdom so this was a short text i wanted to read as an introduction and uh, uh, i would like to leave and the rest you will see in his uh, uh, work and if you read it uh, um, certain motives will be clear uh, for example there is politics uh, and there are uh, concerns which relate to the environment where uh, there are concerns which relate to uh, the state of the world we live in which is uh, we see a lot of migration going on wars which are causing them and indran has his own take on all of that and his poetry really uh covers uh, a really wide canvas of uh, human the range of human emotions and experiences and uh, his lines are pithy as you will see and uh, uh, although he can be critical of his own work but we'll talk to our talk of that later maybe um and uh, and also about the line that he shares uh, which he himself says that uh, and um, poets believe um, that there is a line that travels from William Blake to Walt Whitman to Allen Ginsberg and uh, Uh, i think indran is a worthy inheritor of that legacy and uh, if i may say so as i'm his junior uh, in poetry uh, but i would like to give it uh, uh, to indran so he may read his poetry and uh, once uh, you feel that you have read enough or if you want to read all of it indran uh, that is fine by me too and then we can uh, take it up or as you wish and uh, you can uh, direct that and i'll follow through thank you thank you so much everyone you thank you Prakriti, thank you, uh, Peter, uh, for the invitation. Uh, uh, very hard to follow those those remarks, Abhimanyu. Very hard indeed, um, but uh, I will do my best. Um, I, I'll start with a poem from *The Elephants of Reckoning*, which was my first book published in 1993. Uh, two poems from this book, and then go on from there. beating the drum i was walking across the brooklyn bridge in man uh, between manhattan and brooklyn when this poem occurred to me 
The rat still runs through the tunnels of my blood. An elephant's trumpet in the war chest of my heart. And Kabra Goyas, the reptile kings, slither out of my eyes. Beat the drum. Beat the drum. Facing the bridge and the fog. Facing the towering city across the water. Walking upon the water. Beat the drum. The fog will clear. The clouds take back the rain. And the sun burn again on the rogue elephant's back charging up the footpath while over the sea the herd trumpets while over the sea the herd trumpets kiss kissing your lips i try to forget roses or the fruit of palmyra trees sweet and strong tongue lolling upon tongue Heart beating against heart beating. These are my words signifying our human bodies, which poetry does not capture. The absolute desire I have to kiss your lips on this hot and sunny afternoon. I do not know how much longer I can walk about the garden kissing roses or perambulate the toddy tavern of my dreams where black faces and white toddy mix in black and white memories of Jaffna, Sri Lanka, my Tamil country far away on an island across the sea, far away and far away, the Palmyra fruit and your lips, to drink toddy now, to kiss your rosy lips now, to uproot the roses in my garden and offer them upon my tongue now, to fly to Sri Lanka and grab the last fruit on the tree before history throws the Tamils into the sea, as it said it will do. Before all this and everything else, before the apocalypse, I do so sincerely wish, though my words may not fit, to rest my head in your hair and kiss your lips. I wish that were indeed the case that one can rest one's head in someone's hair and kiss her lips and that will solve the problems of migration and of exile and of and of uh, and of war and its consequences you know um Amen I'll read that. I'll read now from um, a book called Uncivil War and uh, a bit of a jolt from that sort of nostalgic uh, poem I just read. Um, this one's called Fire Department. Where is your village burning? Where is your village mind feels? Where is your village blasted in crossfire, wounded under jungle trees? Where is your village running across marshes, shot in the back? Where is your village waving white flags, frisked, registered, supervised in a camp? Where is your village blowing up army friskers, other villages? Where is your village, Toronto, Berlin, Tamil Nadu? Where is your village, Madagascar as option has not been discussed? Where is your village? Hasta la vista, special envoy. Where is your village burning? And the very last poem in the book on Civil War, which is a sort of a history of the Sri Lankan war over the 25 or whatever many years or more that it lasted. Ready to move. We are Mayans, we are Tamils. We are Armenians, we are Germans who lived once in Poland. We are Burkinabes stuck in Abidjan, Somalians in Maine and Massachusetts. We are witnesses to the only truth worth repeating. Have a bag of essentials, holy book, toothbrush, a fresh set of clothes, ready to put on your back when historical conditions 
change suddenly. Um, I'll read one more poem and then perhaps we can chat a little Abhimanyu about the, um, about the themes raised in these poems. Um, this is from a book called The Splintered Face, Tsunami Poems. It was published uh, in 2008. I was, and I took the book almost on fresh off the, the press um, to Sri Lanka to the Gaul uh, Literary Festival that, that January of 2008. And, and read from it there. Um, and it's a book written after the tsunami of 2004, and um, which was another sort of attack on the island, one can say, by some force beyond the control of the residents. Um, yeah. And one of those poems is, uh, is called Face. So I'll read this and then we can pause a little bit and chat. Sure. Okay. Face. Imagine half your face rubbed out, yet you're suited up and walking to the office. How will your mates greet you with heavy hearts, flowers, rosary beads? How shall we greet the orphan boy, the husband whose hand slipped, children and wife swept away? How to greet our new years and our birthdays? Shall we always light a candle? Do we remember that time erases the shore Grass grows, pains modified. At Ikadua in 1980, I wrote a ditty, a sailor's song about rain in sunny Ceylon. I don't know what Calypsonians would compose about this monstrous wave, this blind hatchet man. Don't know the Baila singer's reply. We are a happy and go people, yet the fisherman's wife knows that her grandfather was eaten by the ocean. Fisher communities have suffered in time. And what's happened now is just another feast for that bloody sleeping mother lapping at our island. But what if the ocean were innocent? The tectonic plates innocent? What if God were innocent? I do not know how to walk upon the beach, how to lift corpse after corpse until I'm exhausted, how to stop the tears when half my face has been rubbed out beyond the railroad tracks, and this anesthetic, this calypso come to the last verse. What shall we write in the sand? Where are gravestones incinerated? Whose ashes are these earned and floating through a house throttled by water? Shall we build a memorial some calculated distance from the sea in a park in the shape of a giant wave where we can write the names of the dead? Has the wave lost its beauty, considered now obscene? Yet tomorrow, tomorrow, we must go to the ocean and refresh ourselves in the sea breeze down in Hikadua, where it is raining in sunny Ceylon. Tomorrow, we must renew our vows at sunrise, at sunset. Let us say, let us say the next time the ocean recedes and parrots gawk and flee and restless dogs insist their humans wake up, we will not peer at the revelation of the ocean bed, nor seek photographs. We will run, we will run to higher ground and gather there with our children, our cats, our dogs, our pigs, with what we've carried in our hands, albums, letters. We will make a circle, kneel, sit, stand in no particular direction and pray and be silent and open our lungs and shout thanks to our gods, thanks to our dogs. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful poem. Thank you. So, regarding, uh, if I may, uh, regarding the collection on civil war, I have a, uh, I have a poem there which I quite love, although it's uh, terribly sad also at one level. And before coming to the poems that you have just read, I wanted to uh, also just bring that here. Uh, there you have a poem. It actually starts off uh, with the poem, A Flame. Um, 
about the riots against minority Tamils in Sri Lanka, collectively remembered as the Black July of 1983. And uh, uh, I'll just read it and then ask you the, what I wanted to uh, say about it and ask you uh, the question. Um, it's called A Flame. I'll just read a short excerpt. Uh, remembering Black July 1983, what is a poem to a man hiding in the cellar of his neighbor's house, breathing the way his hostess spices, lentils and mutton, while son and daughter keep quiet, not one word aloud in the mother tongue, and wife strokes her neck the golden wings of a thali, and across the lane a mob, ruffians, tonton makutes, lynch squad, a few holy men, politicians in white veshtis, light rage, and so pestilence in summer fires. Uh, it's a longer poem, of course, and uh, I'm just reading it till here, which, because I think there are several uh, important things here to notice. Uh, um, for example, like, you know, I mean, uh, here also in the tsunami poems also, you're just opposing uh, what, you know, is a kind of either man-made or, let's say, God-made disasters, a riot uh, and uh, tsunami. And you are just opposing in this poem, for example, and in others, that you have read also, and uh, the one you read about tsunami, other general day-to-day -day activities that keep life going, that keep the fabric of life stitched together. And uh, um, But still there is, of course, this menace and that we can sense, and especially in the poem about the riots. And of course, there are also uh, references that, uh, that uh, refer to uh, references that uh, connect us to your, uh, uh, your past, which has been uh, spent in so many different cultures. For example, the reference to Tonton Makutes comes from uh, Haiti, I suppose, where you have served. And this was the Haitian uh, um, squad, a kind of uh, stormtroopers. Uh, and uh, of course, then you also uh, so uh, you know, it's a searing verse, I could say. And uh, you sketch the whole anatomy of a riot, which is common in South Asia. There is a convenience of the state, the role of so-called men of religion, the fright felt by women and children. Uh, but the most important thing that I see here is that is the opening line, which completely uh, blew me away. I mean, what is a poem to a man hiding in the cellar of his neighbor's house? I mean, these four lines, I find like, you know, you're uh, even in tsunami. So, I mean, how important is poetry uh, in the face of man's insignificance? Is Because uh, I think it makes it much more potent when you, uh, when you acknowledge that there is a certain amount of, to want of a better word, impotence in poetry. You know, I mean, capabilities, uh, if, if I may ask you to elaborate on this, I think you get my question. Yes, yes, uh, uh, it's a very uh, eloquently stated, uh, Abhimanyu. I mean, exactly, the impotence of poetry. I mean, one thinks of uh, Auden's line about poetry makes nothing happen. It exists in the valley of its saying, a way of happening, a mouth. I've always railed against that line, you know, I've always been an activist, activist poet, a political poet, and I wear that phrase um, without any, any shame, I wear it with pride. But at the same time, when I think of political, I think of the business of the community, the word polis, uh, the root word meaning community, a community affair. So I, I think poetry has a, a role to play in telling the stories of what's going on in the community or between the communities or... Uh, at the same time, the impotence, yes, um, I mean, really, uh, the priorities, you know, should we spend our, our money on developing, uh, getting uh, millions out of poverty, or should we spend it on building uh, uh, museums and, and, and uh, symphony orchestra spaces and making art available in the public square? And I mean, these priorities, and, you know, art usually gets... Uh, dismissed uh, as, yeah. as, uh, and, and not attended to and, and something for the private individual to sponsor and fame. But without art, uh, without poetry, um, the substance of life, the, the passion uh, of life, the freedom one thought of the imagination, that, that, that is such a precious gift that poetry has given me, that my, my life, my upbringing has given me, that sense that you cannot imprison the mind you know, and the notion that the mind is is perhaps the last uh, free territory. Uh, and I think poetry and expressing poetry has helped me uh, develop that idea. And I like to share that idea with with everybody, whether you are living in a captive environment, 
under an oppressive autocratic uh, uh, state or whether you're living in a, in a uh, democratic uh, system, democracy, the least bad of systems as uh, Mario Vargas Llosa once described it. I mean, the point being uh, you need tools to liberate yourself and to help you feel uh, that you have your independence, even if it's uh, an illusory independence. I, I wrote a poem recently about a chicken or a bird, uh, a free range bird. Now, what is that? It's an ironic concept because you're called a free range bird, but, you, but you're still within a corral. There's a larger fence around where you range freely and eventually you will be killed because you are eaten. I mean, at least in those who are meat eaters will eat that, will eat you. Um, yes. So you're all eaten or you eat. So how do you get out of this vicious cycle? And po perhaps poetry can help uh, 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 free you from the, uh, the ravages of, of violence, breeding violence and, and biological uh, imperative. And uh, we have to find, make peace. I remember writing an article about the conflicts in Sri Lanka uh, uh, a long time ago when I and published it in, an, in a major newspaper in, in the States. And it, and it basically talked about, I uh, told a story about an elephant who we were in a Jeep in, in Yala in the South, uh, in Sri Lanka in Ceylon then. And uh, there was a man with us, a Mahout, who spoke the language of elephants. And there was an elephant in front of us, a rogue elephant who charged our Jeep. And he shouted some words and the elephant stopped its charge and we were saved um, by this communication. So I was asking, what is the language that he spoke that we can uh, use to heal our wounds in the, uh, in, in the Sri Lankan, uh, in the Silanese polity? Um, in any case, um, even to use the word Silanese is a political act, it's a, it's a nostalgic word. It's a word for a time when there was ch a chance to heal the wounds before they were even uh, let uh, caused, you see, uh, between the different groups on the island. And we can only look to the future. A friend of mine who passed away, a wonderful writer recently, used to tell me, why do you care so much about the roots? Think about the branches and, and where the leaves and where they lead. And so I, I like to think that I am, in the end, I've learned the lesson of my friend and I'm looking uh, towards the branches and the leaves in the future. But uh, I still, of course, uh, look back as well. And, and I think history is a role that uh, the poet has to uh, play his part or her part in, in telling. And that's what I try to do in Uncivil War. I, even though as I was writing yeah. some of the poems, the bombs were falling and the poems, and I say in one poem, you know, <laughs> these, these will not stop. This will not stop the mm. uh, the apocalypse take, being taking place. I mean, the, the the killing that was that was taking place at the time in two thousand and nine, when so many thousands uh, lost their lives and yeah. uh, in the killing fields in the north. Uh, anyway, I'll stop there. But I hope that's a, a, an attempt to answer that, respond to that question. Yeah. Most certainly, and uh, I would also like to ask you. Uh, of course, you, you mentioned Auden and uh, you said poetry makes nothing happen. I personally believe that it makes things happen, but not in the way we may like, or like, you know, I mean, but regardless of that, uh, uh, but you are quite, I see in your work that it's very clear that for you, uh, nothing can uh, convince you otherwise. Uh, you put poetry on, uh, you give it an important place in life and you do not think that it is any less than any material comfort and which I see in your work and which I, it appeals to me. To come back to the other uh, poems that you read from um, uh, Tsunami, uh, the Tsunami poems, the splintered face, the Tsunami poems, uh, there's one poem in particular that I wanted to mention again, it's a short poem, it's called Interpretation, and it goes, uh, Mass at Our uh, Lady of Matara was interrupted that Sunday morning, her doors flung open to greet the prodigal son. Again, uh, there is uh, your fondness for biblical metaphors, which I see more and more in your work. Now that I have read it more carefully, and uh, there is also a, it is actually a, a one sentence which has been divided in a poem, and uh, in one sentence you have uh, captured uh, an event of apocalyptic intent and impact. 
um is this uh, like you know i mean uh, this is quite symptomatic of your craft if i could say is is that correct to say yeah well, thank you i you want to uh, uh, you know uh, well one of my teachers was alan ginsberg and he said cut half the first draft out so and then ezra pound wrote 26 lines and he made it into two which was in a station of the metro you know these apparitions of faces in a oh, crowd petals and a wet black bow so yeah. distilling cutting down to the essence is is certainly part of the aesthetic and by the, the practice and here yes you're right very right to say this is one one line vertical line broken down and then and it try and it's um, in one image or that you know to make the point of, of the prodigal son the return of the prodigal son in this poem is 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 problematic because you know the church has been washed away people have been swept out to sea uh and uh, while the prodigal son uh comes in and who is the prodigal son is it the wave the destructive wave uh when, and why do we celebrate the prodigal son you know yeah why don't we celebrate the one who stayed at home yes, yes. And that was his complaint work. also yeah that's right that was complaint of and this is a problem of of migration as well because when uh, when you write poems when i write poems about sri lanka and i write them often and i publish them sometimes in ground views which is a, a wonderful news site and opinion site out of sri lanka but then okay. sometimes somebody will come back to me and said with with what right do you have to to comment you know on what's going on in in this country and uh, and when With i return, right that's interesting you are a sri lankan and you are a, right you, know, you belong i there. mean i i'm not saying that i have daily conversations with people about whether i uh, but i think it's 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 in the atmosphere you know and uh, but yes i am but then i feel i also can write about mexico or i can write about uh, haiti or uh, argentina different countries where i've lived or or i have connections to uh, I think ultimately we are all um, uh, one global village and one global family, and we have to accept uh, that there should be no borders between us. Ultimately, yeah. philosophically, I feel uh, that's why I, I, you know, I'm in a sense uh, these anthologies of poets that are defined by geography, by country, nationality. I, I resist to some extent because. Um, uh, they are limiting, you know, and I think they they don't really uh, help us advance our understanding of uh, of a particular uh, a region by just by simply calling it this is an anthology of Sri Lankan poetry. I think it would be more interesting to have a, a topical uh, division, uh, but and to be yeah, inclusive. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And perhaps uh, if you read uh, more poems, the audience would also be uh, would no, love to. I, I, why don't I read from this book, Coconuts on Mars? Yeah, which is lovely one. It's more autobiographical, I'll just see. Yeah, and yeah. it's a book easily available. Of course, it was published by yes. Poetry Walla in India, and it's easily available um, to people uh, in India, but also around the world. You can order it. Um, uh, Hemant Diwate, a wonderful poet who who edits uh, for paper paper wall media. And anyway, I'll read a couple of poems from Please. from Coconuts on Mars. Um, Yes, I do have a sort of a running theme with God and relationships to God, and 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 here's a yeah, poem called "Yeah, uh, Beyond yeah. Age uh, with God." Have you thought of God as a poet? Imagine the joy all round, sun engaging in art dear to the Father, words molded, turned, roasted, love bursting from veins babbling metaphors from every tongue learned on the path and kicking still inspired by the cyclist who broke his ages world record for distance covered in an hour he is 105 i will step outside right after finishing these lines march uphill stretch arms wide wide and write on return an ode to oxygen coursing through blood and thank god and cyclist the morning news I drink with tea for the exponential possibility of body and poem renewed, ready for indoor races, new poems, 
at 106 or 56, age irrelevant. And um, how about, uh, I'll try, you um, You know, one of my teachers was uh, Ramanujan, in a sense, I mean, yes. in, who inspired me. And I was very lucky that he commented on my first book and, and yeah. several months later, he, he, he passed away. And so in an untimely way, um, uh, at only at age 68. Anyway, okay. I wrote this poem uh, thinking of him. Uh, it's I've called, read it, it's a lovely one. Yeah, thank you. It's called Ramanujan. On an answering machine, he left a comment destined for the back cover of my first book. He died months later, prone in a Chicago hospital, his body victim of a powerful anesthetic. He left us speaking of Shiva, poems of love and war, and for that first life changer for me and a generation of young Tamils nursing ourselves into our majority, the interior landscape. He told me once he was most proud of the translations, but after his death, the anthologists are filling their books with his own poems. He worked hard, and the treasure he dug up for readers cannot be removed by fiat or accident or the diseases of aging. I mixed her American pepper every morning with my mother and read again of the red earth and the pouring rain mingled beyond parting. I love that, those lines from the interior landscape, which was a groundbreaking book when it was published in the in the 60s in, in the United States um, and, and the others as well. But um, so um, great debt to Ramanujan, debt to, to Ginsburg, so many, and, uh, uh, so many poets. And a debt to your father also. He was yes, my father. Poem. And there's a poem, a beautiful poem by him in uh, uh, I think uh, one of your collections, I think, I think it's a uh, splintered face. In my yeah. lusty garden, there are bougainvilleas. I'm just saying that's, that's a beautiful. Yeah, my father was, like my, yeah, he very important poet for me. I mean, I, when I started writing poetry, I, I was given carte blanche because my father was a poet, a very good poet. And, uh, and my mother uh, and he both, uh, Sort of let me be a poet, you know, and, and allowed me to be a poet, encouraged me to be a poet. Uh, my father earlier uh, introduced me to Tambi Mutu when we first got to London. Tambi Mutu was a great editor, famous for his work on Poetry London during the war. Also, my okay. great uncle on my mother's side. So I had poetry and poets on both sides of my family. My and father, your brother, and your brother also writes, David. Yes, my brother David writes poetry and uh, and and songs, and uh, very excited about his work. And he um, he's back in Sri Lanka, living uh, living there in Kandy. So uh, so we are, you know, you look back and you look forward. You know the and the the myth of the return or the the possibility of return. Is, is a compelling one. Um, and then my father, when he, we got to Hawaii, my first American experience was in Honolulu, actually, in okay. 50th American <coughs> State. And then my father took this job at the East West Center where he, he was inviting writers from all around the world to come participate in these congresses. And, and he edited and wrote books about what happens in literature when cultures meet and uh, contact literature. And, 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 and for that, one of those conferences, he invited Allen Ginsberg and he invited Ole Shoinka and Ken Saburo Oi and Janet Frame. And, and, and uh, so all these amazing uh, talents arrived in the island. And I was a teenager at the time and I had a chance to meet them and they would come over to the house and, and there were parties and conversations. And so I, I learned a lot by osmosis from these, from these great uh, talents from writers from around the world. And, and I believe uh, now Fez Ekman Fez was also there and uh, at different times in different years. And, um, wow. and in terms of uh, Ginsburg, you already told the story about 
how we picked him up at the airport. We brought him Sorry, home. Sorry, I told you. <laughs> that's okay. But it's a good story. It, it went a lot when Bob Dylan called that morning. Uh, imagine carrying the phone from yeah. Bob Dylan to Allen Ginsberg and you're being a, te a teenager writing poetry. I, I wrote my first, I wrote poems then and I was writing poems. Then I shared one with Allen Ginsberg and he corrected it. He said, you know, he, he gave it back to me, half of it scratched out. And he said, this is what I do with my own poems. And it stuck with me that that adage, though I don't think anybody can really stick to it. I mean, imagine taking half of the words out of the first draft, but but he 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 he, he did it on my poem, and uh, and then later on, he became a sort of public poet and father figure to me in a sense, uh, uh, and so and I, I I value mostly learning what poetry through poets rather than necessarily studying. Uh, in in degree programs or creative writing courses, but I, I've become more sanguine about that. I think uh, I think you have taught also. You have taught and I have that. taught, yeah. But at the time, I thought, well, I didn't want to bother my hurt my relationship with my muse and and, and let it be modified by 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 the class. But I I think the class is fine, and I. Uh, and so I've learned. You see, you do grow up as a poet as well. <laughs> yeah, From your early, early insecurities become less insecure as, as you go on. So. so I have other things to ask you, but if I may ask you to read from Migrant States as well, which is, I think, the latest. Yes, so, the latest book, yes. My son yes. Anandan did the cover of this book as he did the cover Beautiful. of Coconuts on Mars as well. I'm okay. very proud of this, uh, the, the collaboration. And let me read... Um, couple of poems from this book. Uh, uh, why not? I'll read one for my son and one for my daughter uh, that happened to close the book. But I can discuss, you know, there's, it's a very ambitious book, actually, which includes a lot of poetry and dialogue with Whitman. And I, uh, but, but here's one called Summer Chess for Anandan. You go now and I'm sad and the sadness will spill into late summer and autumn until we meet again when the leaves fall and chestnuts smack our memories alive. And you ask, Dad, did you always walk in Regent's Park when leaves turned red and yellow and the morning bristled and the sun seared yet left your skin cold? A cold sun, Dad. I feel it too. This summer that I thought would go slow has turned now into a sprinter's dash. And what's to do? Yes, write and fill days with friends and games and sums until next summer, until the next time we go to bed and know there's no morning flight and your queen and rook are ready to trap my king. And now a poem called Morning Mass Halloween, uh, which I dedicate to Lola, my daughter. But it, my father appears in the poem as well. And, um, Hushed tones, place of worship, early morning. A woman kneeling in the pew could not get up. The priest brought her communion. Then another parishioner called for an ambulance. The fireman, a friend of the ambulance driver, arrived in his fire truck. They worked together naturally. What to do now? Walk to the font dip fingers in holy water, then go out to my car. Paramedics will lay her on a stretcher, pump her heart, wheel her away to the hospital. Life is coming to its end. A repeat. In my dad's case, his heart stopped while he kneeled at a pew. Nobody could revive it. He would have loved to see my daughter smiling as she guards the witch's cauldron this Halloween sweets in hand. I'm very lucky and blessed to have these children, to have the love that, is, that, is, that, that I've received over many decades. And, um, and I continue to, to, to prosecute and uh, uh, to, to, to work this field of poetry, which is, which is the only field where I, I am absolutely at, at home and, and enjoy. I, I, I don't know how much time we have left, but I want to mention um, one other figure on actually, 10 minutes, I think, around okay. 10 minutes. Um, very important for me is my mother, right, with whom I live and whom um, 
who was also inspired by poetry. I remember when I left the island of Oahu to go to university, a long way away across uh, oceans. Uh, I'm sort of used to crossing many oceans in my life. And I went to Haverford College on the east coast of, uh, in 1978, I think it was. And, uh, and just the look of my mother's eyes as I left. And I always thought uh, it was very difficult to write about my mother because she is, after all, um, uh, the one who literally brought you onto the, onto the planet. And uh, the, the, the bonds are very uh, deep. And, uh, but then I ended up writing some poems. And, and so I think in, in a future book, I'll have more. But I'll, I'll read one, uh, perhaps one of the poems from uh, Coconuts on Mars that, um, where I talk about, um, where I talk about my mother and, um, uh, and it's called, um, let me just, uh, let me just, it's called Domestic and, and Foreign Affairs, I think is the title. Um, I have, yes, that's right. And um, so uh, thinking of, of all of us and, 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 all our, and our mothers. My mother wishes to travel to Honolulu, to Lourdes and London, to Colombo. She wants to make the trip back. At 79, her mind has begun to fly, and we, her passengers, are to cancel the obligations of our current lives, gather funds, hire the most plaintive singer, throw a party finer, more complex than any other, to be remembered in poetry. Or we can retire or take extended leave to care for a family member. The means are in our hands, dear brother, fellow diplomat, as you prepare to serve your country again abroad. Do not forget the domestic issue, the mother. Um, it's a poem I wrote in, thank you, my brother, also a diplomat. Uh, but, and our common lot and responsibility, the whole family, you know, to care for each other and what, uh, and our mother. So we're very grateful um, to our mother, to our late father, and, and to all our friends uh, for their gifts of sharing poems, which um, has really been a kind of food and drink without which I, I could not imagine this life that I have, that I try to, uh, you know, through the screen of metaphor, uh, retell yeah. in the poetry. And other than poetry, you have uh, eclectic interests uh, which reflect in your poetry as well. For example, you've written poetry about your interest in cricket. You uh, uh, like to captain and strategize. And uh, that's interesting. I've never read anybody say that, uh, you know, people say I like to be a fast bowler or a batsman, and, but you specifically like to be the captain. And the strategizing, which is uh, interesting. And uh, you also had an interest in punk rock for a while. That's right. I, when I was have, 19, uh, produced yeah. an album. That's Sorry. right. I have an album which you, anyone can listen to on any of the music services like Apple Music or, or uh, Spotify. It's called uh, Rancont Dut, R A N K O N T, and the second word Dut, D, D O U T. It's Creole for a meeting in August, a meeting with doubt. It's a sort of play on words. And the poems I wrote in Creole. And, and musicalized with Haitian musicians and friends in, in Haiti when I was living there. It was a wonderful finish to my stay in Haiti, recording this album in a studio there and, and releasing it. And uh, I hope I can collaborate with them again in the future and with other musicians. I, I'm very concerned about the relationship between poetry and music and poetry and dance. I don't see uh, the divisions. I see them all as part of, an, of one uh, enterprise, and I, and I celebrate um, trying to musical. I mean, poetry is a kind of word music for me. I mean, language is, it's a sort of music. It's so it's a, a species of music, a category of music. You know, uh, yeah, it's I called agree. poetry. Yeah. We also have the Greek hero Orpheus, who was a poet as well as a musician, for example. So the connection is quite from a long time. 
And so that's why going back to Bob Dylan and Allen Ginsberg, who also sang his poems and, and sang the songs of Blake, you know, of uh, innocence and experience. So I, 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 I don't, I, I'm, um, I, yeah, and Leonard Cohen and so many others who've been, yeah. And you yourself, and, who, who makes music, I, and I, so, I try a bit, but there maybe I should uh, ask you because I mean that is one thing I would like to ask you, and it has a relevance for poetry and music and lyrics, as you said. And but the one thing that we have been discussing, and uh, uh, amongst ourselves as well, and uh, we don't have so much time left, so I'll ask it, and if you answer it, and maybe you could finish up with a poem or two, uh, if we have a little bit more time. And uh, my thanks to the generosity and uh, generosity and the graciousness of the audience for attending and. Uh, no, staying with us, I would like to ask you uh, uh, as well that uh, uh, it was Bob Dylan who got the Nobel Prize. There was another uh, round of or aspect of dispute whether he should. I'm not getting into that because, as you said, we think uh, music and poetry are not actually that different. So uh, for me, that is a non-issue whether a musician, so-called, should get it or not. But the thing is that uh, uh, do you think Allen Ginsberg should have got it? Because uh, I mean, he was kind of his guru. And I just find it because as we are discussing, Allen Ginsberg appears so much in so many places in a kind of quiet influence sort of way. And uh, but why not the Nobel? Yeah, After well, I mean, I, I don't know um, uh, if he was nominated or in which years or but I, I yeah, I, it would have been good to uh, have given the, the, that recognition to Allen Ginsberg. And there are others who have passed through who have not received the recognition who who certainly uh, merited it. Um, I mean, the Nobel is a complex, uh, funny thing, you know. I mean, there is one Nobel from from India, Rabindranath Tagore, and 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 one from all of South Asia. So, uh, whereas we have maybe eight or nine Nobel winners from uh, in literature from France, or and and yeah. there's no none. So there are these these human uh, fail, uh, frailties and, 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 and misjudgments. But there are also some great winners of the prize, such as Pablo Neruda, uh, for example, I think, or, or Gabriel Garcia Marquez and, and uh, Toni Morrison. And, and so I think Allen Ginsberg would have uh, deserved the prize for, for Howell and for Kaddish and especially those books and for his his political work. He also was a political poet and he was- I'm a, reminded of Fall of know, America. Yeah. I mean, it's so prophetic, that whole collection, right. like, you know, I mean, I feel, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but- uh, Yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah. Oh, just good collections. And I'm reading the letters between uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti and Allen Ginsberg at the moment, and Ferlinghetti just passed away. What a, yeah. a great, a great force. I mean, he, without Ferlinghetti, we would not have Howell, you know, published as, as it was. And, 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 but, but not only as a publisher, his own work, Coney Island, the mind. So, uh, you know, we are in a time of passing, you know, great and, 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 uh, and, and, and unknown alike passing because of uh, the, the pandemic, because of other illnesses, because of just the reality that life is a, a walk or a, or a race towards it's it's finish, you know, and so what do you do when you're walking towards that that end, and how do you spend your time, and with whom do you talk on the way, and and what do you plant along the way, and what do you uproot? These are all philosophical questions about how one conducts the life, and I think uh, Allen Ginsberg conducted his life, made his mistakes, but he also. Uh, brought so many uh, people's attention, so many poets, and he did a lot of good work uh, for the community, you know, and for the union, so to speak. And I think that's, Absolutely. that's uh, something to celebrate. Yeah. So would you like to end with uh, a poem or two, uh, if the audience would consent uh, to stay sure, with us for or, a bit? or if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to um, respond to any, uh, any, any further questions, but I can end with a, uh, let me just pick um, a poem to, um, to finish, I, I let me read recite something from memory, which yeah. uh, goes back to a book, um, Salon R.I.P. Rest in peace, Salon. Um, but the poem is called "You Must Love." Um, you must love the land when you leave to build your house on the sea. Love what's lost, the mango tree burning in the garden the curious noose of the familiar coat of arms. Love the ball turning strong, spinning in a dark faraway land. 
Love the tongue, you'll never again speak, that wrapped you and bled you and dried up some every day on the other side of the sea. Actually, I'll stop, but if I may, depending on time, I would like to also read one other poem. It's a, it's a new poem, and I wrote it uh, when I learned of the passing of uh, my friend uh, Adam Saminsad, the writer. Uh, and he, uh, and I mentioned it earlier in, in the conversation about, um, about him. And, you know, he, Adam Saminsad was a pseudonym. Um, uh, and and I'll, um, I'm just going to find the poem now. Uh, shall I shall yeah. I read it or do we have time or are we? I think we can go ahead and let's say uh, we have directions to the contrary. Maybe okay. uh, if we have five more minutes. We I started five minutes late also. So I think that should be fine. All right. And I'll finish. So it's a very new poem unpublished. It's called Adam. Sure. You told me not to bother about roots, to climb the trunk, to push branches away and reach the uppermost leaves pointing towards heaven, the infinite. You resisted badgering about age and names. What do they matter, you said. You did not tell me that Adam was a pseudonym and your American single room red life a secret adventure where you explored the underbelly in the other side of cities. I did not know your family then, Shant Cottage. You kept so many details in a lockbox beneath your beard. I wondered who was this angel with a razor blade and devilishly limber mind haranguing me on a more than 20 block walk through Manhattan during our first encounter. We would enjoy others by sand dunes driving up the road to La Molina in Lima, your earlier visit to Mexico City. I remember how much you wanted to meet the poor in the center of Santa Fe, not rich suburbanites on the hill the Loma, where we hosted you. The money I earned as a diplomat brought a fine meal to the table, but you ate seeds instead and sported a body like a rod. You did not want any sign of privilege, no roly-poly belly. I wish I could have stopped that rogue driver who slammed you off a bicycle in Amsterdam and saved you thus from all the operations to come, the unfinished novels, the unpublished poems, you did not have strength to revise your complaints, but not your dismissals of dictators and your giving every last penny to the tramp, not your heart speech the last time we spoke in some gray evening after you left Lima, the ride to the airport, saying goodbye to the Americas and to you, Adam, always outside of Eden, beyond the uppermost leaf. For Adam and for all of us. Very Thank evocative. You. Just a second, just a second. And then there is a question, if, if we yes. take it quickly. Um, there's a question by uh, uh, Aruna Krishnamurti. Hello. Uh, um, and it goes, I often teach Sri Lankan literature in my South Asian lit class, and I'm thrilled to hear your poetry that I'll include for sure. I sometimes worry about how students' experiments on or uh, related to Sri Lankan literature is almost always through the experience of violence. I would love to hear your thoughts about this. Always through the experience of violence. Yeah, yes. I mean, it has been a violent uh, life, you know. This growing up with this the the, the civil war, and even before I was born, the 1958. I was born in 1960. The what I call euphemistically the riots took place, which were directed attacks against minority Tamil homes and businesses. So it's been an unfortunate reality of this paradise but it's a paradise in flames, a paradise uh, of divisions, of disputes. And so it's very hard to, to, to put it aside and write uh, poems um, uh, outside, of that, outside of that, but we do, and there are wonderful poems uh, and, and stories, I think that, that, that exist uh, despite this, uh, this violence, but the violence is part of the zeitgeist, part of the spirit of the times. Unfortunately, it cannot be uh, denied. Uh, and I, so I, I rather think we should assume it and write about it and exorcise it that way and, and continue to write our love poems, you know, which such as, for example, in the book Coconuts on Mars, there are poems that one could read 
and not think of the um, the circumstances or the or the the bomb exploding, uh, you know, up the road, uh, and not. I mean, I I always think of. Uh, I mean, it's just a, a, the part of the reality. You live with multiple realities, you know, in, when you're living with conflict and 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 strife, and um, you compartmentalize, or you, but you go on with the or business of living, and you go on making your food and making love and, yeah. and sharing. So. Um, um, those things go on, and the poetry is reflected. Yeah, I can share those some of those other poems with with the person who wrote. Uh, if you like, just look look me up. Yeah, yeah, and she just uh, commented uh, further that uh, Miss Krishnamurti that actually your poetry is a testament about migrancy, enabling a poetry without beyond violence. Thanks so much for sharing. So that was the comment we had, and uh, I don't think we have any more questions, and I think we have run out of time as well. So. Mr. Griffin may uh, guide us further. Uh, there is one more comment. Uh, yes. So I'll just quickly read that. Uh, this is uh, taking off from the last question. It says, it is uh, from Ms. Geeta Sukumaran. Uh, and she says, it is impossible to get over the violence since there is no proper closure to the issue and the trauma lingers, which I think is an important question. But anyway, I think we have run out of time. So I just said that through as a comment if we can't have it answered. So, thank yeah, the you. Trauma lingers, yes. Uh, yes, unfortunately, yes, we have run out of time. We are a bit over time. And we are conscious of the sure. fact that, uh, you know, all over the world, people have so much of their lives over these screens right now that bring us together. So could result in some fatigue. So we try not to go way over the time that we uh, say we would do in the beginning. Uh, yes, folks, if you for Indran, uh, Prakriti will be happy to uh, put you in touch with him for the conversation. For now, uh, I would like to say thank you very much to all of you for attending, for making the time in your day to spend an hour and more with poetry. Uh, thank you very much, Abhimanyu, for that conversation. And for thank you, and thank you to the audience also. A very good evening to them, and I hope they will have a nice evening, uh, the rest of it as well. Thank you, Indran, for those lovely Thank books. you so much. And uh, switching roles for a second as being part of the audience. Thank you, Prakriti Foundation, for, as usual, doing the fabulous job of organization and bringing these poets together. Thank you, Mira. Thank you, Harish. Thank you, Ranveer, who's not here. I'd like to remind you folks that next week we, we have another reading. We, of course, we, it's the first, uh, first three Saturdays of Avima. Next week is Ms. Tansin Ranvi, a friend of mine in Bombay, uh, a professor of architecture, Poet, a translator, and a very nice guy. Yes, next week. Before that, on Friday, Prakriti has a special event, which is a conversation with Rahul Merotra, which uh, Randall Shah will be uh, guising and moderating. Uh, you're invited to that. The event is free and open to all. And uh, last uh, duty of all, I'm going to ask everyone to just uh, harish you to please turn on your video so we can take a screen grab for the archives. Video and your best smiles, please. Give me a thank you. Together. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good thank night. you, Harish. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the organization. Thank you.